Each person who is born must die and be reborn again and again in a cycle of suffering and hardship. Perhaps we'll die in the morning, perhaps in the evening. We don't know. But we can be certain that death will come when the time is ripe. Pilgrimage Faithfully each year, when the cold season ended and the sun began rising higher in the southern sky and warmer days lengthened, Mechi Gao led a small band of nuns on a pilgrimage to visit a John Mun, who was living in the neighboring province of Sakon Nakon. The first late winter rains had fallen by then, leaving the mango trees bursting with a constellation of blossoms and humming with swarms of nectar-hungry bees. Preparations had to be made for the journey, a twelve-day trek over the Pupan Mountains, down into Sakon Nakon province, proceeding along broken, hilly terrain, and into the broad valley of Banpur Nanai. The supplies were heavy and cumbersome, so the nuns carried only enough food to get them over the high mountains, where settlements were scarce. When their meager supplies ran out, they would rely on the generosity of small, far-flung farming communities that were often located a full day's hike from one another. Uncooked rice was packed in plated bamboo baskets. The pungent pickled fish used as flavoring was stored in clay jars sealed with fresh beeswax. Dried meat and fish completed their diet, along with the wild forest plants they foraged on the way. The nuns left Ban Hui Sai nunnery walking in a single file, with Mei Chi Gao in the lead. In addition to food, each nun carried a few basic necessities in her shoulder bag, and an umbrella tent to protect her from the elements at night. Simple, homemade sandals sheltered her feet from rough ground and sharp stones. A plain cotton cloth covered her shaved head, protecting it from direct sunlight. By the end of the first day, the nuns had reached the Pupan foothills. The jungle was teeming with bears, tigers, and snakes, with only a scattering of human settlements located in crude pockets of cultivation. The weather was difficult and unpredictable. Still, the land was beautiful, verdant and rich, thick with bamboo and rosewood, and carpeted by grasses, ferns, and wild flowers, a landscape of massive trees rooted in tangled undergrowth. Spacious vistas at mountain passes gave way to vaulted canopies of foliage and creepers, and then to myopic tunnels of chaotic vegetation. Protruding on ridges, undulating outcrops of black sandstone flowed over hillsides, breaking and folding into deep crevices where the trail could easily disappear for an inexperienced traveler. While passing a small village, the weary travelers could hear an offer of food and support. Grateful and with love in their hearts, the nuns took what little they were offered from the impoverished donors and searched for a secluded stream to bathe and camp for the night. Each nun sought shelter under a handcrafted umbrella suspended from a tree limb, with a thin cotton tent cloth draped gracefully to the ground and encircling a bed of straw and dry leaves on which she could meditate for the night. Some nights, in the small hours, Mechi Gao dreamed of a John Mun. His stern but caring face peered at her mischievously, as if to say, Where have you been all this time? What's taking you so long? Can't you see I grow older by the day? She shuddered, hearing the urgency and the steely resolve in his voice. Each morning the nuns partook of a single, simple meal of steamed cooked sticky rice, kneaded into bite-sized lumps and dipped in fermented fish paste. Their meals were sometimes augmented with slivers of dried meat and fish, freshly dug roots and tubers, and a selection of forest herbs, spices, fruits, and berries. Their daily repast was just enough to sustain body and mind on the long march to nightfall, as the nuns traveled one step at a time, one mindful moment after another, and always in the present. After almost a fortnight of hiking along time-worn footpaths over mountains and through valleys, past fallow rice fields and orchard groves, Nechi Gao and her companions finally arrived in the vicinity of a John Mun's forest retreat on the afternoon of the twelfth day. They were met first by the residents of Nong Pyo village, gracious women bustling with hospitality who helped the nuns bathe and wash their dusty robes. Once refreshed, the nuns made their final hike along the gently sloped and winding path to a John Mun's monastery. A John Mun's monastic community was nestled in a dense jungle at the upper end of a broad valley. The valley was surrounded by overlapping mountain ranges that seemed to stretch on forever, making it an ideal location for the kind of solitude which the Dutanga monks sought. 
Clusters of thatched huts dotted the mountain ridges where groups of five or six families eked out a living growing crops and hunting game. Many Tutunga monks relied on these remote communities for their daily alms food, just as Mechi Gao and her nuns had done on their journey. The nuns found a John Mun seated in the central sala, chewing betel nut. He seemed to be expecting them. Eagerly, the nuns kicked off their sandals, quickly washed their feet with scoops of potted water, and scrambled up the wooden steps to meet him. Always pleased at the sight of Mechi Gao, a John Mun roared out a rough greeting in the Putai dialect, threw his head back, and laughed. The nuns prostrated in unison before him, making three fluid bows, their white robes swishing gently with each graceful movement. They sat respectfully to one side with their legs tucked neatly beneath them, smiling softly, expectantly, and mindful of his fearsome reputation. A John Mun never failed to greet Meiji Gao and her students with warmth and courtesy. After exchanging pleasantries and giving encouragement, he arranged for them to stay overnight in a secluded bamboo grove on the monastery's edge. Tonight they would sleep once more in their umbrella tents on piles of bamboo leaves. Tomorrow he would have the villagers construct sturdy platforms of split bamboo for his guests. He always welcomed Mechi Gao as if she were part of the family, and insisted she stay as long as she liked. Each morning after he finished his meal and the nuns had eaten theirs, a John Mun gathered them around his seat and began to speak in a crisp, clear voice, chiding them for their laziness or urging zeal and determination. They were lively, animated conversations. He was particularly interested to hear of Mechi Gao's meditation adventures, strange and mystical tales of disparate realms of life and consciousness. Though he rarely contradicted the accuracy of her observations, he tried gently and persuasively to reverse the focus of her mind's eye inward. Mechi Gao was obviously enthusiastic about her remarkable ability and proud to show off her otherworldly exploits. Ajahn Mun was a master of all worlds, seen and unseen, known and unknown to all but the purest of minds. And while he was impressed by her mind's capabilities, he was equally concerned of its risks. Better than anyone, he knew the danger of visions and the illusion of knowledge. The pure mind knows all things equally, evenly, but attaches itself to nothing. To help Mechi Gao shift her perspective and experience the true wonders of her mind, Ajahn Mun taught her many different methods. However, ingrained tendencies form habits, and habits have their own inevitable momentum. And habits have their own inevitable momentum. Many years before, Ajahn Mun foresaw that a dynamic teacher would appear in the future to steer Mechi Gao along the right path. And so, in the end, it was left to fate to determine the time and circumstances of her awakening. Year after year, Mechi Gao saw the tide of Anicca, the law of ubiquitous change, overtaking a John Mun's physical form. His body was aging quickly now, though his mind remained a diamond of the finest brilliance. Mechi Gao had always maintained a very close spiritual relationship with him. The fact that her nunnery was mountains and valleys away mattered little, for she was often aware of his presence in her nightly meditation. His appearance was radiant and sublime, giving no indication that he had endured the onslaught of a grave illness shortly after she left him that spring. But as time passed and his condition rapidly declined, the tenor of his nocturnal visits changed. There was a poignant urgency in his voice when he insisted she hurry to visit him one last time before it was too late. It frightened her to think that he was dying, but she was aware of the world's true nature, the nature of life and of death and of their inevitable uncertainty. Still, she procrastinated. On many occasions, visions of a John Mun warned her to come without delay. Perhaps it was hope for his recovery that kept her from accepting the seriousness of his illness and the nearness of his death. Perhaps she was preoccupied with her own spiritual quest and aware of his watchful presence. Or perhaps she was simply lazy. Whatever the reason, she procrastinated. She occasionally told the nuns to prepare for another long trek, but she always neglected to set a date. So, despite his admonitions and repeated warnings, Mechi Gao was still at Ban Hui Sai the night a John Mun passed away. The hour was past midnight. Mechi Gao had been seated, meditating as usual since nightfall. In a moment of deep, motionless calm, a John Mun's radiant presence appeared one last time. His countenance flashed his tone fierce and so direct that it shattered her composure. With a voice like a thunderclap, he admonished her for being negligent. 
out of pure compassion with the love of a father for his daughter, he had exhorted her repeatedly to rush to his bedside. Now it was too late. Soon he would pass into final Nibbana and depart this world forever. When she went to see him, she would find only a corpse, which had no consciousness remaining to acknowledge her. Negligence. Laziness. Another lost opportunity. Don't let defiling emotions take over, Mei Gao. They are the source of an endless procession of births and deaths. Never assume that mental defilements are somehow harmless or trivial. Only a heart of courage and determination can defeat their tricks. Look inside and let Tumma be your guide. Earth, water, fire, and wind, ground, sky, mountains, and trees, heavens, hells, and hungry ghosts. These are not the paths, the fruitions, or Nibbana. They do not reveal the truth to you. Do not expect to find it there. They are all true within their own natural spheres, but they don't contain the truth you should be seeking. Delighting in them will merely lead you endlessly around the vicious cycle. Stop spinning. Look within yourself. The truth of Tamma arises only within the heart. It shines only within the heart, like the full moon in a cloudless sky. Long before the first light of dawn, Mechi Gao withdrew from Samati meditation with a cold sweat clinging to her white robes. She was tired and disheartened. She felt a hole in the bottom of her heart. She felt a deep loss of her teacher, her pride, and her hope. She laid down to rest, but she could not sleep. The energy of the emotion was too strong. She wept softly to herself, breathing slowly and deeply to ease the pain. When the first rays of light spilled into her room at dawn, she rose, gathered her composure, and moved briskly in the morning chill to meet the nuns at the main sala. Tears formed as she opened her mouth to speak. His vision, his admonition, his teaching, his death, the story of a John Munn's final appearance poured from her lips and rolled down her cheeks. The nuns had known Mei Chi Gao long enough to believe in her extraordinary gifts of prescience. Still, they were reluctant to accept the sad news so readily. As Mei Chi Gao finished speaking, and the nuns huddled together with conflicting emotions, the village headman bounded up the sala steps and blurted out, Kun Mei, have you heard the news yet? Have you heard the news? He took a deep breath and exhaled slowly and said, almost in a whisper, A John Mun passed away last night in Sokor Nakorn. I heard it on the radio just a few minutes ago. They say he died late in the night at 2.23 a.m. As the nuns wept uncontrollably, he apologetically added, I'm sorry, Kun Mei. I thought you should know. Ajahn Mun died on November 10th, 1949, two days after Mei Chi Gao's 48th birthday. By the time his funeral ceremony was held in late January, she had already traveled once to Sakon Nakorn to pay her respects. Kneeling before his casket, its entire front panel made of glass, she gazed upon his lifeless remains and felt a twinge of remorse. Quietly, silently, she asked his forgiveness for all her past transgressions, and resolved for the future, no more negligence, no more laziness, no more regrets. As the cremation day approached, Mechi Gao and the nuns made the long trek to Sakon Nakorn one more time. They arrived just in time to see the monks solemnly carry a John Mun's casket from the temple pavilion to the funeral pyre. Mechi Gao, along with many in the large crowd, wept openly as his body passed by. He had long since entered the sublime, pure land of Nibbana. Never again would he return to physical, bodily existence, the land of tears and lamentation. She watched, spellbound, as the fire was lit at midnight, and felt his unmistakable presence as a small moonlit cloud began to rain ever so gently on the burning pyre.